Good morning, and welcome to Palliative Care and Geriatrics Grand Rounds. A special welcome to all those tuning in from Care Dimensions, Dana Farber, and Cooley Dickinson, and to all of you here with me. I'm B.R. Dobman, I'm the course director, and it's my privilege today to introduce this morning's speaker. Dr. Jonathan Rosen is a clinician scientist with expertise in genetics and imaging. He received his undergraduate degree in Greek and Latin and his medical degree from Columbia. Dr. Rosen has spent his entire career at Mass General Hospital and at Harvard, where he completed residency and fellowship, serving as chief resident in neurology. Dr. Rosen is a professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School and chief of neurocritical care and emergency neurology at MGH, where he is appointed to the J.P. Kistler Endowed Chair. Dr. Rosen's research group is housed within the MGH Center for Human Genomic Research and the Broad Institute of M MIT and Harvard. In 2017, he was appointed Managing Co-Director of Mass General Neuroscience, a hospital-wide initiative to weave together and enable the vast multidisciplinary neuroscience community that is among the world's foremost. This year, in 2018, with his colleagues Rudy Tanzi and Greg Fischioni, he launched the Henry and Allison McCann Center for Brains. The hallmark of Dr. Rosen's scientific work, described in over 280 scientific publications, is the combination of careful clinical and imaging characterization of patients with the most rigorous approaches to genetics. Dr. Rosen's studies have improved the management of patients with hemorrhagic stroke, as well as influence prevention strategies for patients at risk for stroke. In 2007, Dr. Rosen established the International Stroke Genetics Consortium, which has grown into the leading force in stroke genetics and is responsible for all of the enduring genetic discoveries in common forms of stroke. I could and probably should go on, but I will stop there um, and ask Dr. Rosen to join me, welcoming him. To the Thank you for that very kind introduction. I'm so glad that you cut it short. Um, <laughs> So um, I'm here not to talk about uh, genetics, and I'm not here to talk about uh, sort of the, the, the uh, acute part of neurocritical care. Um, what I'm talking about today is a project that we've been working on for the past seven to eight years uh, that's aimed to change the way we think about the care of the brain. And I'm delighted to be able to introduce our new center, thanks to a very generous donation from Henry and Allison McCants and their family, um, and introduce to you what, what we are doing and aim to do, and talk about a few of our studies, which I think will be particularly relevant to this audience. Um, here are my disclosures, none of which are relevant to the material I'm speaking about today. So the, just as a, a point of departure, um, the way we want to think about the brain is no longer uh, whether or not you have Alzheimer's, whether or not you have bipolar disease, uh, if you have depression, what treatment uh, should we give you? We wanna uh, really think about the brain as, as our individual identity. And uh, the genesis for this center was really about focusing on what matters to us, to our patients, um, how we feel, how we can take care of others, um, how we can uh, be of service to society, how we can take care of ourselves. These really are the questions that uh, our patients come to us when they're concerned about their brain function. And so the, the center was founded to address these questions in a scientific uh, level. So the, the first thing that we have to understand is that uh, if you think about individuals who have brain disease, I'm a neurologist. I don't know if there are any psychiatrists in the room. Or, oops, sorry. Or any um, psychologists, social workers. If, if you have a disease or you have symptoms, in other words, if you're red, then there's a place in the hospital, there's a place in the medical system to seek care. You can call up a department of neurology and ask for an appointment. You can call up a department of psychiatry. But let's say instead of being red, you're yellow, which means that maybe you have two siblings with Alzheimer's disease, or you got a test result, an MRI for some reason, and you were found to have early changes consistent with early Alzheimer's disease. So you're asymptomatic, but now you're suddenly at high risk for becoming symptomatic. There really isn't a place in our current healthcare system, certainly at Mass General, to seek care. And then finally, what if you just are motivated? You know that uh, the uh, risk of being affected by brain disease at some point in our lives, if you think about 
the whole range of psychiatric and neurologic diagnosis is about 30% over the lifetime, maybe even higher, because probably we're underdiagnosing anxiety, post-traumatic stress. So all of us probably would like to take steps to do whatever we can to reduce our risk of developing these diseases, developing the symptoms that accompany those diseases. There's certainly no place in the medical system for those. And then finally, for those of you who are good at going to get your primary care, you'll remember that the last time you were there, you probably had a blood pressure check and a cholesterol level or lipid panel. Um, but was there anything specifically devoted to assessing your brain health or your risk for developing brain disease? We don't have that in our system. So that's, so our goal is to serve the yellow and the green population, and then to begin to think about how to integrate serving those populations into primary care. Big goals. So our mission is to generate discoveries in essential for enhancing the brain health of the global population. And in doing that, we want to develop an integrated approach to brain care. No longer is it about whether or not you go to psychiatry or neurology, uh, whether psychotherapy versus psychopharmacology, uh, whether integrated medicine is the right approach. They're all relevant. And so in order to do this right, we have to engage all of the disciplines. And then finally, because this is about um, uh, uh, taking care of individuals, helping individuals who don't have disease, we have to integrate an approach to brain care into primary care and probably out into the community in order to enable ultimately, which is what I would, the best way that I would characterize what each of us wants is that we want to be able to maximize our potential, maximize the potentials of those we love through brain health. So we've uh, set out because uh, as you'll hear a little bit, we're scientifically grounded. We've set out three key research questions that we aim to answer over the lifespan of the center. First is how do you define and measure brain health? And we'll be uh, working in collaboration with laboratories across the hospital as well as with technology companies to begin, begin to understand how to measure brain function, both uh, through uh, sampling and omics, as well as through remote monitoring and uh, appropriate questionnaires. And we wanna be, begin to be able to offer assessments to individuals who come to see us. We've gotta sort out the biology because there's an incredible need for new therapies that prevent brain disease. Uh, as this room knows, uh, treating brain disease once it's happened uh, is generally uh, of limited success. Um, and then uh, we want to really focus on not just traditional medicines, but also lifestyle choices. Because lifestyle choices, as we are learning in a laboratory, as well as we're seeing from studies of, of uh, human populations, uh, play an enormous role uh, in delaying um, the symptoms, for example, of Alzheimer's disease, or in, uh, in mice, you can see exercise uh, having an extraordinary impact on the generation of new synapses and, uh, um, and even uh, neural growth. So, so there's a lot to be done through lifestyle choices. Uh, <clears throat> my two co-directors were sort of representing the, the broad uh, range of at least scientific expertise. Um, uh, Rudy Chanzi, whom you know, uh, is one of our one of the world's leading neuroscientists, uh, an expert in Alzheimer's disease and genetics. Greg Fritchione is head of the Benson Henry Institute, psychiatrist who's uh, really pioneered integrative medicine approaches. And then I sort of straddle the world of patient care and, and translational research and uh, applying genetics at the bedside. Uh, just a few photos of, of our investigators who are already involved in some of our work. I'm going to speak in depth about uh, two, two studies that we're doing, but I wanted just to highlight uh, some, uh, some of our investigators. Uh, for example, uh, Aaron Dunn, who's a psychiatric epidemiologist who's been working with us for quite a few years. Uh, she studies uh, the impact of early life experiences on the risk of developing that first episode of depression. Uh, or anxiety uh, in young adulthood. And you can imagine that if we could prevent that first episode, that would have a substantial impact on public health because one of the uh, consequences of developing that first episode is that you're at a high risk for a second and a third in a recurrence. Um, we have um, uh, Jill Goldstein, uh, whom many of you may know, was a recent recruit to, uh, to our hospital 
who is heading up a, a large initiative on uh, women's health, uh, heart health, um, and brain health. And uh, she's uh, starting a, a fabulous cohort study that we're going to be a part of looking at um, how to prevent Alzheimer's disease in those without symptoms. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, this couple, Sonia Vallab and Eric Minikel, who uh, many of you may have read about in passing uh, in these various uh, august publications uh, or have, have heard recently there was a two-part uh, uh, interview, a two-part story on them in, on NPR. Um, Sonia is a, a graduate student at Harvard, uh, was a lawyer when uh, about to be married when her mother uh, started to develop symptoms of dementia. And um, her mother underwent genetic testing, was found to have a, a mutation, a uh, dominant mutation uh, for um, uh, what we call uh, familial fatal insomnia, uh, uh, not, not familial, I'm sorry, uh, for a, a prion related, not, uh, that's another one, a prion related uh, dementia rapidly progressive. And so uh, Sonia had herself tested and found that she also uh, had a mutation. This was at the time of her wedding. Um, and so essentially that's a, a, a time bomb death sentence. Uh, a, she, she was uh, just shy of 30 and uh, the likelihood that by the age of 50, she was probably gonna be affected by a, a rapidly fatal dementia. So she and her husband, Eric, who was an urban planner at the time, um, quit, quit their jobs and went back to school uh, to devote themselves to finding a, a treatment, a preventive treatment for this disease. And so they were, um, uh, they were recruited to, to Harvard and, and they're now at the Broad Institute where they've been single-handedly working to uh, do all of the uh, preliminary biology to figure out what kinds of treatments could you administer probably into the brain or into the CSF of individuals like Sonia who have a mutation but don't have the disease yet. So um, she would be a yellow. Uh, and, um, and so uh, they, they are now part of our effort because uh, our goal is to figure out how to get uh, candidate treatments and they've developed one into um, clinical trials as quickly as possible. And you could imagine the FDA is uh, not so uh, used to being asked to approve clinical trials where you take healthy individuals and administer potentially quite toxic therapies into the cerebral spinal fluid uh, and, and where their likelihood of benefit is gonna probably be 20 years out. So fortunately we've been, uh, I should say they, they are amazing. Uh, they have uh, gathered this community around them and they've gone to the FDA. The FDA has a, approved a pathway uh, for a, a, a drug trial. And so now uh, the challenge is, is getting uh, mutation carriers from across the country to, to join in. And there's been enormous enthusiasm as you could expect. So that, that's the biology piece. I'm gonna leave that now. And I'm gonna just mention that we also have a uh, collaboration uh, through uh, a long-standing friendship and uh, collaboration I've had in Hong Kong where a partner center has been started and uh, I'm very excited about this because uh, it turns out that medical care in Hong Kong is uh, quite limited. Uh, uh, patients are happy to go to doctors but they see doctors as kind of you go when you don't feel well, the doctor gives you the prescription and when you run out of the medicine you stop taking it. So that's not so great for blood pressure. And it turns out that hypertension is one of the great enemies for brain health. So the estimates of the various public health bodies are that if we could adequately control the, the, the uh, blood pressure of the aging population in the West, we would reduce the uh, number of Alzheimer's cases by about 30%. So hypertension is, is a, it's a problem in Boston. It's a much bigger problem in Hong Kong. And so uh, we've started a partner center there to specifically focus just on getting hypertension treated properly. Um, and uh, I hope to be able to talk to you more about that in the coming years. So now I'm gonna focus on the clinical programs. I've told you a little bit about the research. Um, we have, uh, at the core of our research enterprise is gonna be a, a longitudinal cohort of individuals who come to us to seek care. So yellows and greens. And um, they come to us to get access to everything that Mass General can offer, but they don't have disease. So their needs are gonna be slightly different. 
Um, and you can see here, this is just a list of the various uh, services that we are either have available, the, these are, are growing here. Uh, we have a program, for example, that we're developing in Ayurveda medicine, uh, which I'm happy to answer questions about. And um, this is, uh, I hope you can see it, this is uh, what our, because these individuals don't have disease, uh, we're calling them participants rather than patients, but they are very much, uh, they're treated as patients. They're just, they get a, uh, you know, a, a medical record number and inevitably there is some uh, diagnosis that we can use to bill for the insurance company. This is not a private pay situation. This is just like any other consultation. Um, and uh, what happens is that uh, our, our, we have a, an office uh, uh, on 100 Cambridge Street where our coordinator sits who receives phone calls, does an initial screen, and then um, these individuals ultimately see uh, a, let's see, they see a physician, either a neurologist or a psychiatrist, and we take uh, slightly different histories from the histories that uh, we're used to taking. We're focusing on development, we're focusing on what, uh, what's prompted the patient to seek care, and we're always interested in trauma, uh, because uh, trauma, as I'm happy to talk about in a different context, plays such a dramatic role in how we engage in the healthcare system, and also uh, it, it, it really does play a role in brain health. And then um, these individuals are uh, invited to join the research program, uh, almost all do, and then uh, we stay in touch with them every six months with questionnaires, and we're developing uh, remote monitoring technology, or we're not developing them, but we're working with companies to ultimately have uh, more sophisticated and uh, high-tech ways of staying in touch with individuals. And because we're interested in the lifespan, we want to make it as easy as possible for individuals to stay in touch with us, not necessarily to receive care, but at least to be reporting uh, their, what, what, uh, what they're experiencing. Um, we have a particular uh, uh, chorus. This is just I'm going to this is just to give you a sense of our, our the, the most um, recent assessment of who, who comes to see us. Uh, overwhelmingly female. Um, you can see there's a large age range. Uh, a lot of family members of patients with disease. I would say that's the biggest category. And then you can see here that there, there are, these are the individual um, kind of complaints or uh, diagnosis categories that ultimately define. Um, we have uh, had a little bit of a challenge. We, we have been seeing a number of individuals who have a primary, uh, usually it's mild cognitive impairment or even frankly, I've, I've had a patient come to me uh, who, who told me she thought she had Alzheimer's disease and, and, and unfortunately she was right. Uh, so we're trying to sort that out because these, this isn't the population that we're set up to, to, to help and uh, obviously we can refer them out to the, to the specialty uh, clinics right away. Um, so now I'm gonna talk to you about a particular uh, um, sort of the cornerstone right now of our practice developed by Anna Maria Ranciona, who some of you may know is a psychologist uh, who works uh, obviously in the Department of Psychiatry and is also uh, involved with Benson Henry. And um, uh, she and her team developed a, a, a course for our uh, participants called My Healthy Brain, which is a lifestyle program uh, basically to, to get people started. Um, and so uh, because it's, uh, we have some capacity, I figured for this audience, in if this is something that uh, uh, you guys are thinking about, I would say not for your patients, but for the family members who are willing to uh, uh, become connected to Mass General in a clinical way, uh, this might be appealing. Um, it's a, it's a, a, an eight uh, session course, and it really is a way of introducing individuals uh, in a simple, appropriate um, manner to understanding how the brain works and, and how you can begin to think about behavior change. Um, we, we are, uh, one thing I have to highlight here is that um, we're not in a position to integrate individuals who have uh, psychiatric disease that requires active management. That's, uh, it's been uh, something that we've learned. So these, this is the, um, these are the eight sessions, one on motivation, sleep, physical activity, nutrition, medication, substance use, social relationships, brain reserve, and uh, enjoyment, actually, I mean, joy. Uh, you could imagine that this could go on forever. 
I want to highlight a couple of things that we've learned. Um, medication adherence, you know this, is, is if we were to uh, diagnose that, if it were a diagnosis, which it's not, I would imagine that the prevalence would be close to 80% in, in, in even these individuals. And um, I found that particularly with the, um, so I take care in, in my specialty world, I take care of people who survived hemorrhagic strokes. And the number one thing you can do to prevent a recurrence is to get the blood pressure really well controlled. And uh, the SPRINT study and the SPRINT MIND study are pretty compelling. And they got a lot of national press, international press. I can't tell you how complicated it is to get people to take their blood pressure medicines. First of all, you got to get them to admit that they don't take them. And then um, you really have to, I mean, I have to devote an entire half hour session just to helping them becoming comfortable with it. And uh, there's a whole field devoted to this, but I, I think this is a, a very clear opportunity for brain health. And the reason I say that is because if we can compel people to think about healthy choices and think about medication adherence as a healthy choice, I think we'll have a have a big impact. And if we can do it early on in their lives, when, when the, the, the um, fear of medications is not as great, I think the impact can be much, much bigger. So that's one of the goals here is to get people to become uh, slightly more sophisticated about how they think about their brains and their behaviors. So the next project I'm going to talk about is one that I think will resonate very uh, strongly with this audience. And frankly, um, it's probably inspired uh, by my exposure to palliative care, both as a practitioner and as a, as a patient myself or as a family member. Um, and it's called the Recovering Together Project. And uh, it was uh, developed uh, in response to the needs that my colleagues and I in the ICU recognized that our patients' family members had that we weren't meeting. Um, and this too has now been taken on by Anna Maria Ranciono, who has really uh, uh, been a, an international leader in this, in this project and has, has uh, done an amazing, I'm so sorry, uh, amazing uh, job of, of uh, uh, developing a, a strategy that we think we can begin to export. But um, the key issue is that uh, it was clear from our anecdotal experience that when we would see uh, survivors and their family members in the office after they'd been discharged from the ICU, um, they would be traumatized and they wouldn't ask questions. And it was clear to me that was part of the problem with their not taking their blood pressure medicines. They were fearful somehow that this medicine was somehow related to their getting another stroke. Um, so, uh, so we began to study this and, and I was uh, able to recruit Anna Maria about five years ago to take it on. And it's one of the greatest uh, things I've ever done as an ICU director. Um, so, so what we've learned is that, as you know, acute brain injuries, the stuff that gets you admitted to our neuro ICU, almost always is unexpected. And it's traumatic. It's traumatic for the patient, it's sudden, but it's traumatic for the family member or the caregiver who discovers the patient lying on the floor, not himself or herself, suddenly having lost that independence, whatever it is that, that makes them themselves. And when we did a systematic assessment follow-up, sure enough, uh, we confirmed our, our suspicions, which was that there are very high rates of depression, anxiety, and PTSD at hospitalization, so this is uh, when we interview individuals, in, interview individuals in the hospital, interview them at three months, and then again at six months. And this is the patient, and this is the caregiver. And then you can see that the rates of anxiety are high when they come in, and they don't, they don't diminish. Rates of depression, similarly high, and they don't diminish, and then rates of, of post-traumatic stress are high and they don't diminish. One of the key things here is that the overwhelming majority of these individuals whom we're assessing don't have a history of any of these diagnoses. So they're now endorsing symptoms that perhaps, or, or we, we don't know, but that they're essentially endorsing for the first time. They may have had latent symptoms that, and they were compensated, that's possible, but it's very clear that um, they've never uh, sought any kind of care for these symptoms in the past. So um, once we saw this, and we know the natural history of these three 
conditions. That is that once you get it for the first time, even if you can treat it, your risk of a recurrence is high. And we also know, not from our work, but from the work of many other uh, communities around the country, that the presence of these, if we're gonna call them diagnoses, interferes with your ability to, to take care of yourself and to, uh, and to, for example, adhere to your medications, among other things. Um, and then we also know that these are actual risk factors for recurrent stroke, recurrent brain hemorrhage, uh, heart attack. So this, was, this to us was an opportunity for prevention and it was not only that, it was an opportunity, it was a crying opportunity. I mean, we had, we had to do something. And sure enough, uh, yeah, the other piece that I think is really important, I'm glad that I have this reminder slide, is the, the rehab. So our patients are going into intensive rehab to Spalding or at home, and they need to be motivated. And what's the first thing that zaps motivation? Depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress. So um, we, we've begun to think about uh, prevention about five years ago when this started to sweep the um, kind of the national, um, the national consciousness and uh, particularly at the NIH level, I'm pleased to say. And so uh, one, of the, one of the questions that my psychiatry colleagues asked from the beginning was, well, why don't you just start prescribing antidepressants? And they were saying it, they weren't being that serious, but, but it was a question that we were asked. Um, and it was clear to us right away that that missed the boat, right? We wanted to somehow change the way the brain was wired in a, that allowed folks to behave differently. Um, and it's not clear that antidepressants do that. They might, or they might allow that to happen, but we also weren't gonna engage in, in a drug study right away because of the risks involved with that and, and the complexity. Um, and so NIMH uh, in the last five years or longer has really uh, begun to focus on this and has begun to invest resources actually in this kind of work, which is terrific because they've been so uh, biological and psychopharmacological for so long. And then uh, the American Heart Association, uh, which is the parent organization for the American Stroke Association, uh, came out with these uh, recommendations uh, first in 2015, but then uh, much more definitively in 2017, uh, uh, focusing attention on what, again, you know, and we've known from just being at the bedside, that if you're gonna intervene in this setting, you gotta intervene for the dyad or probably even more, the triad or whatever you wanna call it. It's not about the patient. It's not about the caregiver in their own silos. It's about the, the, the unit. And uh, we were thrilled that this was becoming more and more mainstream. And uh, interventions should not just uh, address both the patient and the caregiver needs and outcomes, but also their, the way they support one another. Um, and this notion of skills rather than just support. In other words, skills being, how can we enable our patients and their caregivers to become active drivers of, of their recovery? Um, and so these were other recommendations that were uh, embraced by the scientific statement that we have embraced in our project, which I'll tell you more about shortly, uh, in particular, the live video delivery. So, <clears throat> There's this model, are there any psychologists in the audience? No, maybe remotely there are, but um, there, there ought to be. <laughs> uh, so there's this model to skills-based intervention development that I was very interested in learning about. Uh, obviously, I, I'm a genetics guy, I've done clinical trials. This is my first foray into uh, this kind of work. Um, and you gotta kind of march down the model. So you have to first, you got to uh, do your quantitative assessment. Well, you know, what, what's the, what, what, what are the conditions out there that you're trying to treat? And I showed you the rates of PTSD, depression, and, and um, uh, anxiety. And then you've got to start uh, talking to patients and caregivers to find out what do they want, something we don't embrace as much in the biological world, but I've started. Um, and that's how you develop the intervention. And then you got to do an open pilot to actually see if this works. And I'll show you that in a sec. And then you've got to do exit interviews with the uh, groups or the dyads or the, or the folks who have gone through your project to see what their experience was. Then you refine the intervention. And then ultimately, you do a feasibility randomized controlled trial and the full scale 
randomized controlled trial. So we're marching along that path uh, in this project we call Recovering Together. So what have we learned from dyads whom we followed for the first uh, for six months? Well, as I pointed out, the high rates of distress persist over time. They're not getting better without an intervention. And distress is interdependent. You guys know this. Um, so that uh, what you see is that there's a strong correlation between the distress experienced by the patient and the caregiver. And if one member of the dyad experiences less distress, the other member of the dyad will catch up. Um, and the uh, potential mechanisms and intervention targets, we're looking for resiliency factors. Mindfulness and coping are inversely associated with emotional distress. So we wanna focus on those skills. Um, and of course, the caregiver and the patient, their mindfulness and coping are interdependent. Uh, the interpersonal bond is protective against depression. Again, this is like bringing coals to Newcastle. Uh, and then self-efficacy, mindfulness, and coping are inversely associated with emotional distress, just for the individuals if you separate them out from the dyads. So our goal in developing an intervention was really to enhance self-efficacy, mindfulness, and coping skills. So qualitative data, um, we did in-depth qualitative interviews with dyads uh, who display uh, psychiatric symptoms. And then we also focused on the nurses because one of the great things about the neuro ICU and any ICU is that we have this two to one patient family ratio to nurse. We've got nurses who are basically there for a whole shift and their job is to be attentive to everything that's going on with their patient, whether it be the caregiver, the caregiver's relationship with their work or the, the, the marriage issues or the, the son, the estranged son who's living in California, you name it, it's all there, it's all important. And this is something, the luxury of which I, I just can't believe we do this in, in our culture and we're so lucky. So we, we immediately focused on the fact that we've got to help the nurses do this and that the nurses would be the best ways, the best advocates for our uh, patient caregiver dyads, but also probably the, the best agents for enabling them to develop these skills. So first we had to understand what the nurses were going through. So we asked um, what the patient caregiver's perceptions of the neuro ICU experience was in their words. We asked how they cope with these challenges. We asked what the appropriate, uh, what were the appropriate points uh, at which to intervene. We tried to characterize what maladaptive coping styles might be, unrealistic expectations, inappropriate prioritization, et cetera. And we did this in partnership with the nurses. So we have like 85 nurses. So that, that, that's, I would say that someday we're gonna figure out how to get all 85 nurses on board, but, but we certainly have a core group and we're, we're expanding it. And then we wanted to figure out what, what everybody wanted. What is it that they would recommend what is it what that they would suggest we do to help them? So the interview results, we had uh, 24, uh, we focused initially just on the stroke survivor, stroke patient caregiver dyads, two focus groups with the neuro ICU nurses. And the most salient challenges, again, won't surprise this audience that we identified were uncertainty about future health. So ambiguity and uncertainty. I don't know, palliative care, sort of deal with that, huh? Um, fear of the recurrence. So that's a big one. Uh, caregivers and patients uh, often couldn't move beyond that. And so this really was a barrier to leaving the ICU, let alone leaving the hospital, let alone going home. Uh, negative emotions, sadness, anxiety, blame, self-blame, blaming others. Uh, and then the role changes. Big reorganization of home life uh, once you are discharged after a brain injury. And so the skills that we identified that would be needed for coping. Mindfulness, staying in the present moment, trying to help people recognize when uh, anxiety is taking over. Um, problem solving, very simple problem solving. Reminding uh, dyads how many skills they already have. Uh, developing a supportive team, uh, the, the importance of asking for help, and then practicing gratitude. And so implications for the development of, of our intervention were that we needed to clearly focus on education. We needed to be able to 
get information to dyads that was relevant and that they would find useful and that they could receive. Um, anxiety had to be uh, um, addressed head on. And for us in the ICU, our nurses have very high rates of anxiety in case you haven't noticed. Our physicians do too, by the way. And, and, and I'd, I'd be happy to talk, talk to you about what, what neurosurgeons go through. But, um, but address it, labeling it and talking about it and then coming up again with skills to manage it. It's, it sounds simple, it's incredibly hard to do. You can talk about it in a grand rounds very simply, but actually getting it out there and then getting people to receive the, the skills teaching at their level, that's the challenge and that's what we're working on. Um, and then this notion of improving uh, communication, uh, so, so vital, again, you know this. Uh, and so our goal was to develop almost a dictionary that we would all agree, uh, you know, where we would have terms, the meanings of which we'd all agree on. Uh, and then this was the major barrier, of course, is time, although it's not as big a barrier as I think we all consider it if you break down what you actually have to get done. Um, and so what we developed uh, was in-person uh, uh, skills delivery in the hospital, followed up by live video after discharge. And this has been carried out by a team under Anna Maria Branciona's direction of uh, psychology interns, and it's been very successful. So, so what is recovering together? It's, uh, this is what we introduce the pro how we introduce the program to our dyads. It's coping with the here and now, coping with uncertainty, adjusting to life after stroke, uh, interpersonal relationships, Adherence to rehab regimens, so important because it's so much work. I don't know if any of you have had the, the um, experience of going through any kind of physical therapy yourselves, but, but it's all about practice. And so that really does require motivation. Um, and then uh, fear of recurrence of the event, not just stroke. And then figuring out how to tell a story. Again, Coles to Newcastle with this audience. But this is what we've incorporated into our program we call Recovering Together, which has been funded by the American Heart Association, and we now have just received R21 from NINR, so the National Institute of Nursing Research, to uh, study this in the next phase, but also to begin to collect biomarkers to see if we can actually measure, uh, uh, using uh, metabolomics, measure the degree of uh, post-traumatic stress, anxiety, through uh, biological means. So this is just to take you through kind of the, the strategy uh, we use for, for coping here now. There's deep breathing and mindfulness, staying in the present, coping with uncertainty, how to stick with new habits, acknowledging uh, contradictions, coping with worry, um, <clears throat> the home rehab sessions by live video, focus on adjusting after stroke, uh, understanding what stressors are, coping with stress, understanding relationship roles, because they change dramatically, um, uh, and then uh, understanding, beginning to think about adherence and developing strategies for maintaining adherence. Finally, the uh, live video sessions uh, at home focus on the sphere of recurrence and then making meaning, telling the story. Um, and I've seen a few of these dyads in the office, and I, I, it's just really uh, exciting to have them tell me everything. I, I can just sort of sit back and. I don't need to take the history. They've already told me what all the important issues are. Um, and so the difference between, just in my own experience as a physician, between a dyad that's gone through this program and a dyad that hasn't is dramatic. So we've developed the intervention, open pilot. Uh, I'll just uh, tell you a little bit, one story representing our open pilot. This is a, a case report that Anna Maria and our, our uh, fellows are putting together. It's called Build, Building Resiliency After Critical Care Lessons Learned from Linda and Will. So Linda, uh, Will had a, a, a massive stroke and um, uh, didn't survive and they went through our program. And so um, I just like to, I, I, I put this slide in for you guys. Uh, these are the, whoops, sorry. These are the measures of, uh, you know, the, the different uh, measures we use for anxiety, uh, PTS, mindfulness. Oh, uh, over time, you can see that um, for the patient, in this case, he didn't survive, so they stopped at the time of hospital um, at hospitalization. But uh, this was Linda's report at three months. Best experience of our stroke care helped me find closure 
after Will's death. Um, again, this is what, what uh, your field is all about. Um, and we're really thrilled that we can offer meaning to patients, uh, to, their, to caregivers who lose their patients. So we're now beginning to, uh, oops, <laughs> something going on with the Wi-Fi, uh, to refine the intervention. And get, we're, we're gonna do the um, uh, preliminary randomized controlled trial. And our hope is to get this into a full randomized controlled trial uh, so that we can not only demonstrate that this really works, but also then uh, we can begin to talk to payers about uh, how you would uh, pay for a program like this. And then importantly, how we can then persuade our colleagues in neuro-ICUs around the country and the world uh, to begin to, to implement uh, strategies like this. So um, this is where we're at so far. We've got 40 dyads screened, uh, 21 enrolled, five drop out. So it's not, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of work. Um, there are cultural issues uh, that I haven't addressed. And, and uh, some of our patients come from all over the uh, region and, and the country. And so there are issues there too that they uh, prefer to kind of connect locally. Uh, so, but the bottom line is that uh, we're going strong and I'm looking forward to uh, ha actually having Anna Maria come to you in a year or two to, to present the final uh, results. So just to uh, articulate what um, our vision is for how we think to this aspect of brain health is to be integrated into our ICU. Um, we're focusing on at-risk dyads with an at, uh, recovering together toolkit. Um, we are focusing on at-risk dyads where the patient can engage. So we wanna have something to offer the caregiver when the patient uh, is uh, not able to engage in our, in our uh, skills-based treatment. And then we are obviously focusing on a grieving intervention and uh, you, uh, you, you do that with us. Um, and then uh, our long-term goal is to really get this into the nurse's toolboxes uh, because they, um, they have that relationship, they have the desire and this is a way really to expand the skills of the nurses in a direction that I think they're all ready to do, but that, that it isn't part of the traditional continuing nursing education. And uh, we obviously want to make it as easy as possible for uh, survivors and caregivers to engage with us remotely, so videos and apps, uh, and things like that. And then uh, one of my goals is then to actually focus on the nurses ex explicitly with a uh, a brain health stress management program for them, but that's in the future. So just uh, end by acknowledging our team. Uh, it's growing. This is our core group. Uh, my two co-directors and I, uh, Katrina Screen, who is in the audience, who is our uh, program manager for clinical operations, and then Liz Simpson on the right, our program manager for research operations. And then in the middle here is Joelle Salinas, who many of you know, a neurologist who's uh, become our a brain health unit chief. So he really is in charge of the clinical outpatient operations for the brain health uh, clinic and for the, uh, for the practice and then for the uh, enrollment in the longitudinal cohort. So with that, I would be delighted to take questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for um, such a relevant talk to, I think, our population and to ourselves. So I will ask the obvious question of how do we refer patients to you, particularly to the brain health clinic? Yeah. So there's a, uh, the McCants Center for Brain Health has a website on Mass General. Just Google it. And there's a phone number there. Uh, and uh, you'll get right to our coordinator. <laughs> You're opening uh, up the floodgate. Just well, we, we, we are, um, we realize that. So we're working on that. I mean, we, we've been expanding capacity. The truth is that we have been hesitant to market. So uh, we do have some capacity right now. So if you guys want to seize it, get in there now. Get in on the ground but floor. The, but the vision is really to, to, to build this into a, a, a program that isn't like, as, as you guys do, we want to make it so that it's not just us, but we've got to do the research first to figure out what it is that we would offer the geriatricians, for example, or the cardiologists, or, but the primary care phys physicians and the pediatricians are our, our first target. Wonderful. Let me open it up for other questions. Hi, um, excellent talk. 
So Eric, you mentioned about 30% decrease in uh, dementia uh, with control of hypertension. So what kind of dementia are we, is that more vascular or just generalized like any type of, I would believe it's more vascular than any other one or? Well, you. Um, you know, we, we, we pathologists uh, like to distinguish between uh, Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. But the truth is there is such a strong interrelationship between the blood vessels uh, and plaques and tangles that I, I, I think it's, um, I, I don't think it's that useful for us to, um, you know, as practicing clinicians to distinguish anymore. I mean, it's important because, you know, the natural history of, of you know, classic Alzheimer's disease has a predictable course. And so you want to share that with the patient. Um, but uh, in that, so to, to specifically answer your question, that was an assessment made by the WHO, if I recall. And so it was looking at dementia per se, uh, but there's no question that uh, blood hypertension is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, and it's certainly a risk factor for vascular dementia. But there, the overlap is so frequent that to me, it doesn't matter. 30% is 30%. Other questions? I have a question and a comment. One is I'm assuming that part of what you're going to be doing is trying to figure out how do we think about brain health like we think about cardiac health, for example. Like we've got a risk factor profile that we all agree upon and any of us could talk about. We know that if somebody has an echo, what their EF is and what that means. Could you say a little bit about what you're thinking now preliminarily about what those things, I would assume it's anxiety, depression, but are there other pieces that you're you know, looking at to try to think about what that profile would look like? Yeah. So um, I, th I think it's, uh, it's going to be multimodal. And so we've got funding to start collecting uh, blood samples and do omics and uh, begin to ask the question, what can you measure in the blood? And there's a whole host of, it, of new metabolites and things like that that we have to assess. Um, imaging. Uh, and then there's this whole genome business. So... Uh, we are learning so much about the relationship between genetic variation and risk of disease. And I, I think it's highly likely that a substantial portion of our patients in five years will have their genomes. And so we have to be sophisticated at interpreting those genomes in the context of everything else. So my guess is I, I would love for it to be a cholesterol, a lipid level, an, L, an LDL. It's never going to be like that, but it's probably going to be some combination of a blood test, blood pressure, um, maybe a brain image, maybe, uh, and some, some history assessment and some degree of like a, uh, a self-efficacy score or something like that. Because fundamental to brain health when you're young, well, when we're any age, is gonna be habit change. So we're gonna have to figure out how, how to enable people to habit change well, which is a big, Deal. And so there's got to be some assessment of how good are you at baseline doing that. So it's going to be multimodal. It's not going to look like a blood test, a single blood test, but it's going to involve, we hope, uh, blood measures. Um, and the comment I had was, I just love that you're expanding and thinking about coping in this way, because I think a lot of our early intervention research, this is where we're clear where the money is in palliative care. Like what's clear is that patients who see palliative care early cope differently than patients who don't. They have lower rates of anxiety. The caregivers have lower rates of post-traumatic stress symptoms and anxiety and depression, all because we're addressing all of these issues as you're doing with this recovering together. So, and I think what's so important about that is that has been something that's been relegated to, oh, if you're okay and you're gonna go, you feel, you're open to seeing a psychologist, that's something we'll address. Instead of seeing this as core and fundamental. And, and the other piece that I think we're thinking a lot about is it's important, it, we're trying to help people cope with uncertainty of a recurrent event in their cancer and that they could die from that. And what we know is their ability to cope well allows them to have a deeper awareness and make different medical decisions. And so what I love about it is I think um, where you're exploring is exactly what we're seeing as a key um, space for us to be in. And I have to say, I'm, my mind's going with a multitude of ways that we could collaborate because yeah. it's so critical. And it's nice that it's in different fields with the same sort of, um, sort of push forward. 
Well, uh, two things I just want to, uh, going back to your first question, uh, in this context of the, the dyad or the family or whatever you want to, however you want to call it, in the ICU, we expect there will be a blood test that you can take that will measure the degree of PTS or susceptibility of PTS. So I think in different contexts, you could imagine a much more direct and unimodal, for lack of a better term, measure of brain health. Um, but uh, then to take to, so I'm so glad that, you know, this is Newcastle and I'm bringing you coals because if I weren't, I'd be, we'd be barking up the wrong tree. Uh, obviously, you know, and we've been learning from you and your colleagues for many, many years. Um, the centrality of this to medical care, I think, is the, is the key for us to embrace. And one of the, I don't know if I, well, I'm going to say it and you, can, you guys can disagree. The, when you talk about brain health, nobody runs away. People walk towards you. When you talk about palliative care, so often people think, oh, I'm, I'm going to die. And so um, one of the, and, and when you talk about Alzheimer's disease, people will walk away from you. So one of the advantages to this is that we're really changing the, uh, the language a little bit away from you have a diagnosis, you need our help to um, maintaining health just because you want to. I don't know if that's, yeah. Well, I think, you know, we've had to think a lot about messaging, which is our job is to help you live as well as you can for as long as you can. And that is acceptable to people. I think what's nice about this approach is that we're, there, we're always going to need folks like us for people who have active disease. And uh -huh. the caregivers, we know their morbidity and mortality is so much higher. So the idea that we aren't offering them something better and more is really a problem. So I just see this as complementary yeah. in a really important way. Yeah, yeah. I want to make sure I open it up for questions from our remote site. Silence remotely. Any other questions here? Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm a social worker with palliative care. And um, as you move toward communication and meaning, I'm amused to find myself wanting to ask you about blood pressure. <laughs> and I wonder in um, the difficulty that you talk about with people not taking their meds, I wonder if there's any um, measurement of blood pressure before they start some of this education and throughout it. Is there any evidence that um, non-medical, uh, you know, non-pharmacological uh, remedies are affecting blood pressure. Um, I want to make sure I understand what you mean. When you say non, not, you, do you mean like over the counter or do you mean? Avoiding blood pressure um, medication. If they're avoiding blood pressure medication but they're engaging in mindfulness, yes. is there evidence with yes. the groups you're studying that there's any lowering of blood pressure? So there's, a, there's uh, actually Herb Benson uh, of the Benson Henry Institute that did the pioneering studies to demonstrate that, that meditation reduces blood pressure. Uh, so there's a lot of evidence uh, for that. Um, there is much less evidence in patients who, have, you know, who are older and have already developed complications from blood pressure. And um, so, so I, I, I think in this context, I wouldn't see how we could get away from medicine. So the, the, the way that I frame the conversation, and this is not, this is not, we're not studying this, but the way that I frame it is you got to do both. And the first step is to figure out what it is about the blood pressure medicine that scares you. Um, but there is a lot of evidence that uh, behavior change, particularly mindfulness meditation, reduces blood pressure. And we certainly propose it. But as you guys probably know, meditation ain't so easy for a lot of folks to take on. <laughs> yeah. Just one follow-up observation, um, and that is um, a theory that you may be familiar with called parallel process. And so the idea that your patients um, are uninterested in um, taking this uh, blood pressure medicine is um, reflected in the parallel process of um, you being perhaps uninterested in accepting the medication from your psychiatry um, colleagues. The idea of depression medicine and 
that will inform as your process moves forward. I, 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 yeah, say it again, say it again. Um, so if I understood correctly, um, you were, when you um, spoke with your psychiatry colleagues, they were advising antidepressant medicine, and um, your response was to not pursue that avenue, if I heard correctly? Ah, so, so, so okay, just to address that. I, that was a little anecdote I shared, and I don't, don't want anyone in this audience to think that the psychiatrists are like, uh, you know, jumped on this to, to treat uh, folks, to treat family members with, with antidepressants. Yeah. Um, no, I was using that as a, really as a way of, of um, highlighting how challenging it would be to do a pharmacologic a pharmacology trial uh, in this context, as opposed to a skills-based intervention. So I, that that was it was an anecdote. So. For the sake of time, we'll pause there. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Rosen. Thank you very much for the invite.